So let's let's get started. Um, so we're very happy to have Mohit Bonsal here today. Mohit is an assistant professor at UNC, where he leads the NLP group there. Um, Mohit got his PhD at Berkeley, uh, spent a couple of years at TTI Chicago. Um, I didn't have a chance to overlap with Mohit, but Mohit started just after Devi and I left there. We've collaborated a, a bunch. Um, Mohit is the recipient of the 2018 uh, ARO Young Investigator Award, the 2017 DARPA Young Investigator Award, and I stopped counting all the industry awards because there were just too many. Yeah, I, I'm just going to skip that. Uh, but uh, you know, more towards research, Mohit, Mohit has done a lot of interesting work um, at the intersection of, uh, among other things, language and vision, but also knowledge grounding, common sense, extracting knowledge from uh, large-scale internet databases. Um, and today, he's going to be talking about multimodal, personable, and knowledge knowledgeable language generation. So take it over, Mohit. Thanks. Uh, does everyone in the back hear me? No? Oh. I'm not sure if this is on, but I, should we do? No? OK. OK, great. Uh, thanks for coming. So uh, yeah, so as uh, Dhruv mentioned today, uh, I'll be talking about uh, one uh, chunk of uh, work that our group's been pursuing at Chapel Hill uh, on different aspects of language generation. Uh, some of this will go all the way to dialogue generation, conversational agents. But end of the day, uh, it's about NLG, which is natural language generation. Uh, so we'll cover three aspects of it, which is how to bring in uh, multimodality, how to bring in uh, personality-based uh, agents, and lastly, uh, knowledge-based. Can they bring in external common sense, uh, external knowledge? Uh, so this is a more high-level slide that I usually show on uh, what are some uh, requirements, in my opinion, on a different uh, set of as on, on, on a diverse set of aspects that a dialogue model needs if it's operating in your home in the near future uh, and being useful, uh, not just uh, fun. A bit more, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I, some of these should be pretty obvious. So obviously, the first thing you need is uh, if there's a very long conversational history, then you want to have. Uh, uh, inference, like how you want to have the model be able to remember right pieces from it in the past. As So if you use Alexa or Google Home, you are probably pretty aware that I think two, three years ago, uh, it couldn't even, like there's nice examples in the new Jurafsky book where you can say, hey, uh, show me uh, the Thai restaurants, uh, different types of Thai restaurants around me. It will show you a list, then you'll say, what, how is the second one uh, in terms of reviews? And it will have no clue what you're saying. Like you'll say, I don't know what you're talking about. What's the second one? Then I think recently they, they're able to handle at least two turns of conversation where it can do co-reference and it understands what the second one means. Uh, but handling hundreds of turns of conversation, not over just the day, but the week, the month, right? We remember conversations from years ago. Uh, so that's one big challenge in uh, inference models, whether it's deep learning or more structured traditional models. Uh, then you want these models to have common sense and external knowledge, right? When we talk as humans, we assume a lot of shared knowledge. We'll assume a lot of things that we won't explicitly narrate out, right? If I'm using, as a very simple example, if I'm using a very simple word, uh, a very uh, non-simple word, sorry, a complex word in my uh, vocabulary that you may not share, uh, I won't start defining that word at the end of the conversation, right? I'll assume a lot of external knowledge. Uh, and then more complex things like cultural knowledge uh, and so on. Uh, then there is this whole lifelong learning loop, uh, which is the third point, where you don't want these dialogue models to just be static. right? You want them to be able to operate in the environment, get f feedback from the environment, and improve over time. Uh, the fourth point is you want them to have personality. right? You want them to be able to, convin be, uh, able to convince the human audience, especially if they're in scenarios like old age homes or healthcare situations or intelligent tutoring, right? You want these models to uh, be as convincing as possible. Uh, and finally, there's this whole uh, uh, gamut of uh, requirements where these dialogue models need to be grounded uh, in different kinds of other modalities. I'll talk a little bit more about the video side of things, but there's things like gaze, gesture, uh, all kinds of uh, expressions, right? Facial expressions and so on. So there'll be three aspects to the talk. Uh, the first one, like uh, based on the title, right? Multimodal, then person personable or personality-based, and then uh, knowledge-based. Uh, so on the uh, multimodal side, uh, we don't have that much time today. So I'll cover a few uh, aspects, and then we can go into details in questions or in our meetings later. Uh, 
so the main idea here that we are pursuing is that currently, obviously, Alexa, Google Home uh, don't have this capability. Uh, but ideally, if you are if you want a personal virtual personal assistant or a regular personal assistant in your home, uh, it should be able to see the daily activities around it, right? It should be able to share the same visual context as you are so that it has better knowledge of what you're talking about when you refer to things, right? That's what we do as humans when we talk to each other. Uh, so basically, it should be able to uh, hold dialogue conditioned on visual context, right? Both for understanding and then generating a response. So uh, f as a first step on this, uh, we did a lot of work uh, two years, one to two years ago on video captioning. So we want to bring in videos into dialogue. So the first step we did was uh, build a lot of uh, strong models for converting on the fly YouTube uh, and other uh, uh, videos to text, right? So can we just have models that can describe the events going on in a video? So uh, I won't go into these details today, but these are papers that use multitask learning uh, from uh, auxiliary information like entailment generation or even unsupervised video prediction. Uh, I guess some of this looks a bit pixelated, but uh, you basically want the video to predict its future while also the same encoder generates the caption as another decoder, right? So you can share the encoder or you can share the decoder with an entailment task, uh, which means generating a logical subset from the input. Uh, we also tried uh, policy gradient methods here to have logical correction in the caption so that it doesn't generate any contradictory or unrelated information, which is a big problem in these metric-based rewards. Uh, then we started moving to uh, video plus dialogue instead of video to caption. So the first thing we did here was we looked at possible data sets. So there's obviously where do you find data sets that have videos grounded, uh, sorry, chat grounded into videos. Uh, so there's things like Facebook and YouTube, obviously, uh, which are harder to scrape for various reasons. So we started with something called Twitch, which many of you might be familiar with. Uh, this is a gaming platform. Uh, which comes with a lot of very diverse kinds of games. As, as you can see here, it's more a strategy game. Like, I, I'm not good at these, but probably just assume it's like StarCraft or World of Warcraft. Uh, but then there's also things like uh, soccer and basketball style uh, uh, games in that. So what we did was we collected a lot of data on Twitch. And the first paper we did uh, was more on uh, a vision task of video summarization. So given a long video, uh, on Twitch can we generate its highlight, right? A short clip that highlights all the important events that happened in a one hour Twitch game. Uh, so for this, we basically, uh, maybe I'll use the pointer, which side? I guess I can come here, no. I'll just use the pointer on this side. Uh, but basically uh, what you want to do is you want to be able to use the visual features on the game side, but more interestingly also the, vis uh, the textual features on the chat, right? So basically, uh, this brought up some very interesting chat language. The idea of Twitch is somehow very different from Twitter, right? So there's been a lot of work in NLP on Twitter in the last maybe decade, right? And Jacob's uh, group uh, has done a lot of this too. Uh, the Twitch side of things is a little bit uh, different where it's not just space constrained, but it's time constrained. So instead of Twitter where you have X number of characters, here you have to chat live, right? The game's going on. It won't stop for anyone, so you have to type and move on fast with respect to the game. So it brings in its own vocabulary, uh, special symbols, emoticons. There's also multiple users that are talking to each other, so there's a whole discourse element of when you have 10 speakers, how do they interact with each other, in what pattern. Uh, there's also multilinguality, right? So it's a very rich uh, uh, data set for all kinds of uh, research here. Uh, the first thing we did on this was we predicted uh, like I said, the highlight. So we did this uh, multi-channel model where we basically have the video frames coming in on one end, but also the chat coming in on the other end. Uh, and you want to jointly use these features to predict whether each frame should be a part of the output highlight or not. Right? So given each frame in the input video, you try to classify this as being important enough to be part of the summary or not. Right? Uh, so the, import, the visual part is obvious. The chat part was uh, interesting in the sense that if there's some very shouting or excitement style uh, text happening on the chat, this can learn good features that, OK, this is something where the corresponding frame has something exciting going on. So let's put this in the summary. Uh, and we did this at a character level. This was two years ago, uh, where uh, character level models were still new and were coming up, where the idea was that when you have data sets like Twitter and Twitch, 
uh, where the vocabulary is very different from traditional English data sets. Uh, character level models are much better because they are actually building the word character by character and then building the sentence word by word, right? So it's almost hierarchical where they can actually learn different kinds of prefixes, suffixes, their meanings automatically through patterns uh, across uh, data examples, right? So basically when you have very compressed words or very fast typed words or spelling errors or emoticons, it can start learning their meanings directly at the character level. Then uh, this year at EMNLP, we extended this to the task of dialogue. So we said, uh, how can we take this data set as a, a stream of video context and a stream of chat history and then try to predict the next response? Right? So think of it like a multi-encoder setup where you have both the video context coming in and the chat context, and then you're trying to generate the next response as a chatbot trying to be a player, a chatbot uh, player on Twitch. Or, on Twitch right? So this is a paper uh, I point refer to here for details. Uh, we'll cover a lot of topics today. Uh, so this is uh, what we called a video context dialogue, where uh, the task was given a set of frames from a video clip and the corresponding chat. You have to predict this uh, third thing, which is uh, the uh, S9, uh, which is the next response. Uh, and then uh, we have some models here for discriminative models and generative models. So discriminative models mean that you are given k possible next responses, and your model has to rank the best one at the top, or recall at one, recall at five. Uh, and generative models are more useful in the real world, where you're not just choosing between response options. You're actually generating the response word by word. So we have several models here, both from <clears throat> like tri-DAF style, tri-directional attention flow models, as well as bi-DAF models for generation. Uh, and the data and the code is uh, available online. Uh, another thing uh, that I'd like to point to uh, is uh, this thing called TVQA. So this is another video-based question answering task that we did this year, uh, which is the, based on TV shows. So this is uh, probably the biggest corpus on video-based question answering at this point. So it has 150,000 question answer pairs. So instead of dialogue, this is first looking at one shot question answering, but the innovation here is that it's compositional. So the question example would be something like, what was uh, Penny drinking when Leonard entered the door? Right. So you first need to figure out what part of the clip is when Leonard entered the door, and then you go to more like VQA style models where what was Penny drinking at that point in the clip. Right. So it needs both video localization and then more NLP vision VQA style uh, answer detection. So yeah, so the novelties here are this compositional questions, which forces you to your model to require both video localization, which clip has the answer, and then finding the answer inside it. It's one of the uh, only large scale data sets that requires both video and text. For example, movie QA was a popular data set, but the example the, when the data was created, you were not really even shown the videos. You were shown the plot, text plot, and the tur Turkers were asking questions based on the text plot, not looking at the videos. So our Turkers, yeah. So mostly a minute or two minutes, and then they are allowed to. So the Turkers also give us spans. So we created an interface where they could drag the start and end and tell us which sub part of that clip contains the answer and then what's the answer. And then they also created tricky negative answers for us. Uh, so it's a multiple choice setup where obviously the negative answers have to be very tricky to make sense. Yeah, so we've released that. We are that part was a little bit noisy in the sense, uh, not noisy, but just more relaxed. So they didn't do very tight boundaries, which is obvious. So then we have a second stage going on right now where we are collecting both tighter video boundaries, but also object annotations like boundaries, referring expression boundaries. Uh, so yeah, so definitely this is uh, online now. There's a leaderboard now, so start playing with this data set if you're interested. The best part about this, I think, is also that it has very diverse domains. So we went into this data set making sure that this will be something where we can try transfer learning on and also real video understanding, like checking whether our models are really learning something uh, more story-based and more plot-based. So it has relationship-style questions that need thinking over longer-term clips, but also diverse domains. So now we are trying to see whether we can train on something like comedy uh, genre of Big Bang Theory, but then do better on maybe medical genre like house MD kind of shows, right? So we have two, three kinds of very different domains in this data set. Yeah, so I guess I uh, 
probably spoke about half of the slide. So, so this is the pie chart of different kinds of questions. Uh, obviously, uh, Devi and Dhruv's group started creating these pie charts so, uh, for VQA. So this is for TVQA. <laughs> Basically, uh, as you can see, we tried to have a pretty large diversity of question types. Uh, object, category, so that's what kind of questions, action, person, location, but also reasoning, why and how questions. And then there's also abstract questions that start with what. Uh, there's six kinds of shows, Big Bang, Friends, How I Met Your Mother, or sitcoms and comedies. But then there's also medical and crime shows. Uh, we have some initial strong baselines on this. Uh, human performance is 90 on this, and the best models so far. These are already pretty strong baseline models that we released with all your usual multi-channel, cross-attention, blah, blah. Uh, it's, already, it's only around uh, maybe 60, uh, 65 right now, so there's a big 30% gap to fill in. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the link, tvqa.cs.unc.edu. So to conclude this multimodal thread of the talk, uh, we also won't have time to go into this, but we've been doing work since the last maybe four years now uh, on deep learning for language and robotics. Uh, so we had probably the first uh, deep learning, not that it matters, but the first paper on like translating language instructions to action sequences in a map. This was back when the maps looked very simulated and uh, funny in some sense. Uh, but we've done it both ways. So we, to, to move towards interactions, what we wanted to do was we wanted to take an instruction and convert it to a path in a map. Uh, I don't I think there's a lot of pixelation here. This is a PDF, so I'm not sure why. But uh, basically, there's a path here, which you probably can't see. So this is a big room, which has different colored floors. There are easels, hat racks, chairs, all kinds of objects in here, different colored walls. So the instructions basically talk about navigation in this toy environment. So you have to convert the instruction to the action sequence in the map. And we've also done an HRI paper in 2017 where we went from a destination in a map to a path to generating the instruction back. So basically, we did uh, some sort of inverse reinforcement learning here based on human demonstrations to figure out the best path and the best uh, CAS. So these are uh, structured command pieces. And then you translate the command pieces, the CAS pieces, to natural language. And in human experiments, I, I would uh, encourage you to look at the HRI paper. This was one of the first uh, scenarios where our human instructions that were generated by the, sorry, the navigational instructions that were generated by the model were ranked higher than human generated instructions in a blind study. Obviously, the domain is simpler, but they were both humans and machines were operating for the same simplified setup. Uh, we are also trying to extend this to uh, assembly instructions. So when you, are, when you have several blocks on a table and you are trying to uh, set, up, set them up into a specific configuration, right? so basically to move the block closest to the right table edge so that it is to the left of the stack near the front table, left table corner. Right? So very, not very easy, but like pretty easy for you. Uh, but NLP models have the hardest time doing these kinds of tasks because uh, for 30 or 40 years of NLP, all the data sets were news-based, right? Pentry Bank, uh, CNN Daily Mail. And news never talks about leftmost, right of something, left of something, right? So, so basically, we are starting from scratch, which is great because that forces you to think about weekly supervised, transfer learning, distant supervision, all of that. So this is a very interesting data set that came out two years ago. We think still have the best results on this, where you're basically given a source image with a uh, where you have to find the source block, right? So move the block closest to the right table edge. So that's the red circle here. And then you have, so that's the source. Now you have to find the reference and the offset. So the reference is front left table corner. So that's this. And then the offset is left of, no, the reference is stack near the front left table corner. That's the stack, right, on the left side. And then the offset is left of that. So now you have to move this block to the left of the stack. So this model, we, we created a model that finds the source, the reference, and the offset, and then you add the reference and the offset to create the destination. We've also done the reverse now, where we are trying to take a source and a target image and find the instruction that leads you from that source configuration to target, eventually to build dialogue models where if a human and robot are interacting, the robot is not just following, executing instructions, but also giving the next instruction so that they can complete a task, right? And then this is Peter's, yeah. In this hypothetical task, um, is the agent actually moving? So what, what, is the action, what is the action space of the 
This is all still simulated. So you can we've tried this on a Baxter, like a real robot. Uh, but right now, in this case, uh, there is no sequence of actions. It's just a source and an instruction, and you have to create the target. So there's no repeated, like there's no uh, sequence of tasks to finish a configuration, because this already is too challenging right now. So all you need to do is the action space here is find the source. So you get an accuracy for that, whether you found the right source block. Then the, uh, another accuracy is for whether you found the right reference, which is this, right? The stack near the front ta left table corner. And then the final uh, accuracy is on the destination distance. So instead of moving it here, which is the right option, you might have moved it slightly here. So then you're, you get a little bit uh, penalty for. So same as uh, navigation. So you get source, you get reference, and you predict the offset. And then reference plus offset becomes the destination. So there's some new work on like trying to do this in a sequence of actions. Uh, uh, but we are more interested in the dialogue aspect of it, that can the model also generate, go from here to here, but also from here to here, and then have a both-way conversation? Yeah? Can you try to implement this technology in actual computer robots, and can also tell you the same real? Yeah, so that's what I was saying. Uh, we've tried uh, an initial version of this on Baxter, uh, not for navigation, but for Baxter can't move. So uh, we've tried the uh, assembling version of things. And uh, I won't talk about this today, but we also have another project on adding common sense to instructions to Baxter, which is one of those red rethink robots. Uh, for navigation, uh, we've, we've not started it yet on a real robot. We are trying to do this with Fetch, so one of those small uh, walking robots. Um, we're trying to find the right uh, setup. We don't want to simplify it too much, so, but also you don't want to leave it uh, kind of in the department. Uh, so you're trying to first create uh, the right uh, room, like fake room. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we have uh, collaborations with the robotics folks at UNC, and we've, we've already started some of this. Yeah, and then the last piece of this is the room-to-room -room data set that uh, Peter uh, has, where again, we are going from instruction to path, but we are also generating instructions so that, so currently uh, uh, we have, I think, still the rank one on this data set. It's anonymous, but it's us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but that's the, the that's the comprehension part of it, instruction to action sequence. We are looking also at uh, generation of instruction, not just as speaker listener models, but real instructions that can be validated by humans as being better than hopefully other human instructions. And then finally, uh, building a more interactive dialogue version of it. Um, anyway, so we don't have, I mean, I'm happy to take some of these discussions offline. I want to jump into the second part. So this was the multimodal language generation and dialogue generation uh, thread. The other thread we are looking at is personality-based uh, language generation. So what, what are some requirements here, right? When you're thinking of Google Home or Alexa at home, uh, and thinking how to make it more human personality or convincing, these are some of the axes that come to mind. First of all, they should have emotions and style as we use them, right? So there are things like politeness and rudeness, there's sad and sympathetic, right? There's also this whole axis of wit and humor and sarcasm, uh, which the NLP community has looked at, at least sarcasm has been looked at for several years. Uh, there's also uh, this whole uh, kind of direction of not just uh, imitating some, you, you don't want your model to start imitating the human response. You want it to understand the human style and then respond with an appropriate style, right? You don't respond to uh, sadness with sadness, right? You don't respond to, uh, there's, there's so many such examples. So you have to figure out the right sort of uh, appropriate responding emotion and then generate a response with that emotion. Uh, and to the end uh, goal uh, would be uh, when we write uh, say proposals, right? We realize how much of this is important when you're collaborating with people in healthcare or you're collaborating with people uh, in intelligent tutoring style areas where you realize that these chatbots uh, are much more convincing and effective and trustworthy uh, if they are able to have some sort of uh, these uh, paralinguistic uh, axes. So uh, I'll only go into one of these in more detail, uh, which is the politeness axis. So we've had some work in the last uh, two years on how to uh, first have very strong detectors for politeness versus rudeness in language, and then recently how to add those elements into dialogue models, right, when you're generating language. So, so the first slide here is uh, 
based on Brown and Levinson 1987. So this is a 30 year old paper uh, that's a f seminal paper on uh, psycholinguistics work on politeness understanding. Uh, not this table, but so this table is from uh, Dinescu, Nilekulescu, Mizil, so I think the longest name in NLP uh, at, <laughs> at Cornell. So this is Lillian Lee and his uh, then student Christian, uh, who's now also faculty in, uh, at uh, high school in Cornell. Uh, so, so they, in five years ago, converted the Brown and Levinson 87 paper to a set of 20 features, uh, more or less, uh, where uh, the different theories of psycholinguistic politeness studies were converted to features. So some of, so, so first of all, politeness is not as simple as just adding please to everything, right? That's <laughs> because I'll show you like even, even adding the position of the word please can make things rude, right? So this is uh, from the context of online messages and when you email people, right? So this is a data set that was collected based on that. So the obvious ones are things like gratitude, deference, greeting, positive lexicon, negative lexicon, right? But then <clears throat> things start becoming tricky. So for example, the word, if you look at seven and eight, uh, basically if you start your request with please, that has a very negative politeness score, minus 0 0.30, right? So you can start imagining when you write emails and what emotions you're feeling. I think you'll correlate to this, right? When you really want something to be done fast, you start, please, can we do this, right? And that directly correlates with the count, 12 and 13, counterfactual model and indicative model. If you're saying, can you do something, that's rude, or on the ruder side of things, whereas could you or would you, right? So this should all start becoming uh, obvious in hindsight. And then the usual stuff about direct questions and indirect is obvious. 14 to 18 is all about first person start, second person start, right? Uh, if you're saying you something, then that's very direct and rude. Uh, whereas if you say we, Right, I mean, I do that many times. Like, I, I have to, I have to say something with we, even though I'm like not, not at all involved in it. <laughs> right, it's clearly that person's fault. Uh, so yeah, so you learn to be. More, I think this should teach us to be more polite when writing emails. Uh, and then there's things like hedges and factuality uh, at the end. So anyway, so these were features that they studied uh, using a specific uh, Wikipedia-based online messaging uh, request and Stack Exchange-based requests. Um, so what the first thing we did was they had an SVM based on this, right? These are before deep learning, so feature-based classifiers where you actually first come up manually with good features and then you add them to an SVM style model and it learns the importance or weights of those features. Uh, so the first thing we did in, uh, I guess, three years ago uh, was we took a pretty standard now a model like a combination of CNN, RNN, right? So the CNN would be something that would find local features and then the RNN would stitch them together with LSTMs to find longer term memory features. Uh, so we just took a kind of a combination of some strengths of deep learning models and we showed that first of all, you already beat all the SVM style results with that, right? Which is obvious. Then we move on and most of the paper was about why is it beating uh, feature based models. <clears throat> So this was one of the early interpretability models uh, papers where we showed that actually if you look at things like activation clustering, right, where you look for clusters that fire the same neuron in your neural model, uh, we find clusters of requests which correspond to these 20 features. So we were these, so are people familiar with activation clustering? It's basically, uh, I guess it was uh, more in the vision community first where you're trying to interpret your model by clustering things that fire the, the same activation in your model, right? So, so what we found was that most of these clusters were not only re rediscovering these features, right, which is good, but then they were also discovering some new uh, politeness properties that these 20 features didn't cover. So then we send it to psycholinguist researchers like Chris Potts at Stanford and others, and it was uh, obvious to them in hindsight. So one of them, so these four are things, examples of things that were rediscovered, and then at the end, the new discoveries were things like a cluster of indefinite pronouns, uh, which means things like someone, anyone, something, anything, right? So then you start imagining why this is rude. So this was a very rude feature. It came with a negative score because you're saying, can someone do this? Can anyone do this? Can, right? So this becomes, so indefinite pronouns is a good feature for rudeness that wasn't in the list of Brown and Levinson in 30 years ago. And then the other one was even more obvious in, in today's world where when you start adding a lot of punctuation to your emails, like three question marks at the end, we've probably all been there, right? Uh, and uh, the interesting one was ellipsis, which means dot, 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 right? The three dots is called ellipsis. Uh, so these were all being automatically discovered as rude features. Uh, 
and clusters of them. So this was a little bit of interpretability on why is deep learning better than feature-based models in a very interesting application area. So then this year, I guess last year, 12, we started this 12 months ago, but journals take time. So this is a tackle paper <laughs> from a few months ago, finally, uh, where we tried uh, to incorporate style into dialogue using classifiers, right? So when you, you don't, first of all, you don't have, so it's called, the paper title is Polite Dialogue Generation Without Parallel Data. Right, so the thing to understand here is that uh, you don't have parallel data to train this dialogue model on. I don't, which, by which I mean that I don't have data where the same response is written in a regular way versus polite way. Right, so I can't train a machine translation style model of just, okay, because there are data sets like English to Shakespeare or Shakespeare to English, right? And there's been papers that just apply machine translation models to take normal English and convert it to Shakespeare in English or vice versa. Here, there's no such data. We don't have data that's written, an answer that's written politely and rudely and plainly. So we have to do it without parallel data, which means that we can actually bring in classifiers as very strong uh, sort of controllers to add style uh, to language generation. <coughs> because the previous paper, we built a very strong 88 to 90% politeness classifier. So this paper showed uh, three ways of different levels of uh, control that you can have in your dialogue model using classifiers. So the simplest one is the fusion model, where what you can do is your uh, left side is the encoder, right, of the conversational history. And then you're trying to generate the response like a usual sequence to sequence model. Uh, but what you can do is you can take the decoder uh, of the response generator, right, that the bottom one, and you can fuse it, which means you can mix its parameters uh, with the decoder another decoder that's trained on only polite sentences from your polite data set, right? So this is a more shallow style way of a baseline uh, where you can just have your response generator but mix its parameters at different levels, early fusion, late fusion, deep fusion, uh, this is uh, existing work on how to mix the two decoders parameters so that it's not only relevant to the conversation but also mixing some style, right? So the second decoder can just be trained on the polite sentences. The next one we uh, used was a uh, label fine tuning model, right? So this is uh, a pretty powerful model actually and very surprisingly uh, works very well, uh, is the idea that uh, it's a little bit, maybe it's not tricky to understand, but, but the idea is that uh, you still have the sequence to sequence model, right? Input and target, so conversation history, RNN, trying to generate the target response word by word. Now what you can do is during training, uh, you can, take the target response, right? You already know the real response, the ground truth. You can run uh, the politeness classifier on it, get the score, and add that as a label to somewhere in the model, right? Somewhere in the, in the string. So now you can do this for all your, may say, 100,000 training examples. So the model now starts learning that whenever I see a high, high score label here, then my response usually looks very polite. And then whenever I'm seeing a negative or low score label here, my responses are usually looking pretty rude. They use certain different kinds of words and grammar and syntax. So you can train the model like this, and then at test time, uh, you can nicely just have a knob, right? At test time, when you're given a new conversation history and you're generating its response, you can add whatever label you want here from plus one to minus one and kind of have a control knob of like how much rudeness or politeness to generate in the response, right? So this is label fine tuning. Uh, pretty powerful model. Uh, and then the last one is uh, more reinforcement learning based. Uh, basically just policy gradients, not really reinforcement learning. So the idea here is that you have a context history and you're generating its response. So you sample the full response, a lot of samples. When you've generated the whole response, you throw it to the classifier, get the score back, and use that as a reward, right? So if the reward is very high, that goes back as a, if the, if the politeness score classifier gives a high score, then that goes back as a positive reward saying, okay, do more of this, right? And if the classifier doesn't like it, then it goes back as a negative reward and discourages uh, that behavior. And then we are looking at more models now where you can directly incorporate the classifier into the decoder and kind of decompose the loss uh, and see what, because RL has its own advantage, right? You're sampling, you can do exploration more, uh, so there's trade-offs. Uh, so we are also looking at direct politeness classifier loss incorporation into the decoder decomposition. 
So I'll skip probably the results uh, because we have this third part. Uh, but yeah, so the idea, the left side table is basically showing us examples of how well the classifier worked. So we can say things like, well, thanks, I appreciate that. I know, amazing, thank. So these are examples of positive. Uh, and then this would be examples of rude. So this is kind of cherry picked in the sense of showing you a tricky example, right? So this is, you really should pay more attention to what you read. So not, no, like there is no negative words here, right? These are all regular words, but the way you're writing this and the way you are using these words and the position of the words and the word really, it's learning that this is extremely rude. Like this is almost at the end of the opposite spectrum, zero to one. Um, right, so I mean, even this something like, excuse me, does that flask belong to this man? Again, has nothing really negative in terms of, a, it's not as simple as looking for negative words, right, in sentiment analysis but it learns that you're accusing someone of something. So, so this is just the classifier. Then these are results on the dialogue task. So we had to do human mTurk study, obviously, on, because there's no, uh, like we, we tried automatic metrics, but in dialogue, they don't really mean anything most of the time. So what we, sh we, what we did was on mTurk, we had two baselines, retrieval and generic 10, which basically are retrieval-based baselines where they'll either find the most relevant response, but not polite, or they'll find the most polite response, but maybe not relevant. Uh, then we had our sequence to sequence baseline, which has no style in it. And then our three models, fusion, label fine tuning, and polite reinforcement, like reward model. And then we asked Turkers, uh, several Turkers, like there's a whole, the, all the descriptions in the paper, but you asked them for scoring the responses both for quant quality, which is the usual dialogue quality, how relevant is it, how fluent is it, and then also politeness. And the difference is important because you can get a lot of politeness, but really bad quality, or you can get very, uh, high uh, quality, but no politeness, right? But you want the balance. So the diff so the polite RL model is the best balance where it's able to get statistically uh, equal uh, sort of uh, politeness level to some of the strong baselines on retrieval while maintaining quality or even better quality than the original seek to seek model. And then these are some interpretability uh, techniques that we can skip. We also in the paper have a lot of uh, different examples of what these models are generating, right? So this, if the conversation is talking about X is saying you are sweet to say so, Y says pretty song, and then the RL model can say something like, uh, like something relevant, right? You, because it knows you're talking. So, so the, the basic model will basically, like the last two you can see are both maintaining conversation relevance, that there's something about a song and you sound like a goddess, but they're adding politeness to it. But they are still a long way to go, right? You can see the problem here. Uh, maybe uh, you didn't, but the, the, the subtle problem here is that the co-reference is wrong, right? If it's X, Y, and then X again, X, X is saying you are sweet to say so, so they are being complimented, right? And then Y complements them again, pretty song. But then X shouldn't say you sound like a goddess, right? They are being complimented. So obviously there's so many other axes in dialogue that have to be fixed that there's tons of work to be done here but we are focusing on style. So, so you can look at some examples here. And then a shout out for uh, Arjun's work that we did uh, uh, as a summer intern, right, at uh, TTI Chicago. So Arjun, one of uh, Devi's students, your colleague sitting here. So we did the humor uh, version of this, uh, uh, which I think Facebook is also looking at now, had some recent work on this, on how to make image captioning not just relevant to the image, but also humorous, right? So this is the exact same idea where you want some generation of language to be both relevant to the input and have some style in it. It's easy to do one or the other, right? If you're forcing your generation to add style, it's very easy for it to lose track of relevance to the input. <clears throat> so we had this Knackel paper this year on how to insert witty puns. So we call it punny captions. Uh, how to insert, how to generate an image caption that maintains relevance to the image while having a pun uh, inside the caption. Okay, so uh, the last part of the talk uh, is some work on how to add knowledge and robustness to dialogue models uh, or language generation in general. Uh, so again, this is my take on what are the different axes or some of the different axes that needs to be uh, taken into account when you're making language generation or dialogue generation models robust, right? So first of all, they need external common sense, which can have many definitions of what that means, but basically something you should think of as when we converse as humans, there's a lot of assumed knowledge that we don't literally explicitly spell out, right? Because we assume that both of us know that. Uh, there's things like logical entailment, saliency, and discourse, 
which are more low level skills needed in language generation so something so by logical entailment i mean that when you are generating say a summary of a document you need to make sure that it's not generating something that's contradicted to the input document it's not generating something that's totally unrelated to the input document so this is what logical entailment is that it can enforce logically that the output is a subset of the input but this is not like a set in math right it's language so it's very non trivial to ensure that what language you generated is logically contained strictly within the semantics of the input document so this is the whole area called log like and this entailment or natural language inference is a more new name for it uh then there is very even more obvious things like robustness to missing words spelling grammar errors paraphrases so i'll show you some examples on that and the opposite can it be sensitive to important but very small things like adding a negation or an antonym right and then finally can it actually more futuristically verify facts when it's having a conversation with you right with all the fake news and the uh, uh sort of uh, distraction and misleading sort of uh, issues that are popping up today so i'll talk a little bit about each of these probably one to two slides each uh just to kind of give you a bandwidth of uh, ideas that to think about and chat about later so this is a recent conal paper which i'll probably go most de uh, detailed into is uh, adversarial dialogue so how to add robustness to dialogue models so uh, there is two things uh, in terms of robustness like i said right there is over sensitivity and over stability these are terms that are Uh, well known now in the adversarial community so over sensitivity means that the uh, you did something to the input which should not have changed the answer but it did right so in the vision community you can add little pixels somewhere to your face and then the face recognizer totally misclassifies it as someone else right over <clears throat> so in my case uh, in language uh, in a dialogue model these are the five examples that i can give you for that so you can actually take your dialogue history right the conversation i can randomly swap some words i could drop a stop word i could do some paraphrasing of something like say the same thing but in a different way either data level paraphrasing or generative like actually have a model that generates paraphrases or subtle grammar errors that shouldn't really matter in the sense that they as a human you would still understand the conversation and continue but we show that how all the current state of the art dialogue models totally break on all of this right and then how do we fix it and then over stability is the opposite problem that when you make some change that is very important but the model doesn't realize it's important it's too stable it doesn't change the response so again the example should make it obvious we'll show that you can take state of the art models in dialog uh you can add even very obvious things like a not like a negation or antonyms take a word and replace it with its opposite meaning word and the responses don't change so it's clearly showing you right that there's so much shallow or uh, kind of uh, pattern level phrase level uh matching especially with deep uh, deep learning models anyway so that's what the paper is about i i have a nice uh, real example from one of these currently used systems right alexa home without i don't really remember which one it is but i think uh, one of them we tried saying i think i'm having a heart attack right so ideally the answer should be some definition and some help right your alexa or home or something should say someone having a heart attack may feel chest pain which may be blah 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 right it's giving you a de description and giving you some information uh then we just uh, perturb it and paraphrase it and add some grammar errors saying i'm afraid i'm having a heart attack so not even grammar errors just paraphrasing and then it basically can't say anything it says my apologies i don't understand but once we fix it then it can go back to hopefully saying the same thing we didn't try it on alex obviously but we've tried it on current community research data sets So this is what the paper is about I would uh, encourage you to look at it so I didn't talk about the second part so the adversarial testing is where we take all these five over sensitivity and over stability uh, adversaries right which means that we go to the dialogue context break these things in weird little ways and show how all the results go wrong for state of the art dialogue models like the variational hierarchical hred model the re-ranking uh, reinforcement model and the dynonet models uh, and then the way we fix them is something that's pretty well known by now or uh, called adversarial training where for over sensitivity it's very easy what you do is you can actually take the training data and then change it with these changes right you can actually take the conversation history add random swaps to it and then feed that data back to the training model 
to say, hey, even when you see this random swap, the response is still the same. So you should be robust to it, right? So you feed it back as positive examples. For overstability, it's a little bit more tricky because you have to tell the model that when I retrain you, I'm going to show you a negation. So make sure you don't generate the current response. You have to generate something else. But you don't know what that something else is. So we do max margin style negative example training where we, tell, we train the model to say, whenever you see the same dialogue history with a negation in it, you can generate anything but the old response. So you do max margin where every other response can be treated as better than the current response in the ground truth data. But still very simple. Uh, yeah, so basically the results are not important. Uh, what I meant to show here is that uh, when we do adversarial testing, everything breaks, then we adversarially train it, everything comes back again better. And then we, when we do combined models, when we combine all these adversaries together, you get the state of the art results on all the community data sets. And actually even the normal test results improve, not just the adversarial test sets. And then the same thing for human evaluation. Uh, and then these are some examples on uh, how things get fixed after adversarial training. Uh, I guess I have 10 minutes, roughly. OK, 15, OK. Um, so this was one way of adding uh, robustness and knowledge to dialogue models, right? Uh, the more obvious way is this next paper. So this also was presented at EMNLP two weeks ago on uh, this task called multi-hop question answering and reasoning. So there's this whole trend in NLP now on multi-hop reasoning, which means that you don't just uh, take the document and have a one shot uh, find for, you don't find the answer in, a, in one shot. Wait, I, I guess I shouldn't say one shot. It's not about one shot learning or anything. Uh, you, you, so it's, it needs multiple hops of reasoning, right? So Mary went to the market, Mary brought an umbrella, Mary came home, where is the umbrella now? Right, so this is a very, very toy example of that. So basically, you need multiple hops of reasoning inside a very, very long document to answer the question. You need to collect information, some evidence here, then find the next piece of evidence, then connect it to this third piece of evidence, and then combine all three to generate the answer. Uh, but what we showed here was there's this new data set, popular data set called Narrative QA, which needs multiple hops of reasoning, but also generates answers as opposed to just multiple choice or softmax over a large vocabulary. So it actually needs generation of answers. And here we showed that you need multiple hops of reasoning not only inside the context, but your model needs to actually sometimes go outside the context, go to some external knowledge base, extract the right information from there and come back and continue the reasoning inside the document, right? So it's a very complex, even for humans, a very complex procedure where you have to find hops inside the document, go out, first decide when to go out, get the external knowledge, come back, continue the reasoning, and then merge all of this to generate the answer. So this is exactly uh, what we do. We propose this new reasoning cell called NOIC, Necessary and Optional Common Sense Reasoning Cell, where instead of the, so this is the top part is a usual multi-hop reasoning question answering model, where basically you take the question and the context, and there's multiple sort of reasoning cells, like they can be something like max cell, uh, where you have multiple reasoning cells, different levels of attention maybe, right? You attend on one thing, then you make sure you don't go back to that, attend something else, collect all of that. But then instead of having a usual uh, reasoning cell like BIDAF, we have this thing where it's both BIDAF on the context, but also the common sense relations. So basically you have this external process of extracting the right subtree of knowledge given the context and the question. So basically this attention has a bypass here where it can decide whether to also use external knowledge from the common sense relations here or bypass it with this arrow. So basically not to use it, right? So this is the bypass cell where it can decide whether common sense is necessary here or optional. And then at every step you add this capability and the model automatically learns that at each reasoning step whether it needs to combine internal and external knowledge or only internal knowledge. Uh, so this basically, again, is more like a one slide pointer. The results uh, are uh, in the paper. And we should have EMNLP talks recorded and released next week. Uh, I think this should be uh, the second last thing. So, so this goes into fact verification. right? This is another kind of knowledge uh, that's more high level. So uh, everyone's probably heard of fake news, uh, especially now. right? So, uh, so in more technical terms, we can call it fact extraction and verification. 
where given a claim, right? If I just say a sentence, <coughs> that's called a claim. Uh, how do we uh, verify that claim, right? How do we extract the right knowledge first to verify that claim and then verify this claim? So luckily, our community created a very interesting uh, shared task for this at EMNLP called the Fever task. Fever is fact, extraction, and verification, and something. Uh, so we got the rank one here on in terms of 25 teams. It's a very interesting leaderboard. It's now public, so you should go and try to get better results. But the idea here is that you're given this orange claim, and there's three steps here. So you're given all of Wikipedia. Right? It's a very, very large scale task. So given this single sentence in a claim, you have to go to all of Wikipedia, do document retrieval first to figure out what are the most relevant documents that might help me verify this claim. And then inside each of those documents, you have to do sentence or paragraph selection to figure out which parts of these documents might be relevant to answer uh, to verify the claim. And then finally, when you have collected the set of sentences, you have to verify this claim with this concatenated evidence. And the verification is a three-label classification task. So S means, uh, wait, what was this? S, I mean, just S is V, verified, right? It, suff it, suff it suffices this knowledge, this information you've collected is sufficient to verify the claim. R means refuted, that you were able to strictly say, no, this is wrong, it's not true. And NEI is not enough information, which means that the model is saying I'm not able to, dis there's not enough information for me to strictly say verified or refuted. So this is actually uh, very similar to a three-year-old task in NLP, which is known as entailment, right? Nat NLI, Stanford NLI corpus, right? So this is exactly what it is. It's basically given a premise and a hypothesis. That task wants you to classify something as entailed, uh, contradicted, or unrelated, which means that it has ext extra information. So we have a joint model in the paper. It, uh, it's an extended version is coming out at AAA, uh, <clears throat> where we show how we can use the same uh, entailment style neural semantic matching model for document retrieval, sentence selection, and claim verification. And then basically, how do each of these modules help each other to have some joint information flowing across the modules? So the, way, the reason I'm talking about this is that one of the next steps that we are looking at is how can we incorporate this into dialogue models, right? When you're having a conversation with the, the machine is having a conversation, it should be able to take the information that's coming in from the utterance, be able to verify that as opposed to blindly just responding to every conversation, which is harmful because then it can propagate and encourage uh, more uh, fake news or fact, misleading fact uh, spread because if it just continues the conversation, instead of saying, wait, this is infactual, right? This is uh, not, this is a refuted fact. Uh, and then uh, the last thread in the talk is uh, some of this work that we've been doing, like I said, in the bubbles. Right? One of these bubbles is how can we make language generation much more robust by adding more low-level uh, semantic skills into it. So by that, I mean things like entailment generation. Right. So the idea is uh, this left side and right side. Both are uh, ACL and NACL papers on document summarization. So this is one of the very popular language generation tasks, right? Given a very long document, can we generate maybe a 100 word summary of it? So this basically has, <coughs> sorry, this usually has three, four uh, issues. One is saliency, right? You want the summary to have all the salient or important information from the document. The other is redundancy, right? You want to avoid repeated information because you're only given 100 words in the summary, right? So you want to use that real estate is very, uh, expensive, right? You want every word matters. So these have been well studied, right? But the thing that's not been studied or has been hard to study is how do you make sure your summary at the end of the day is not containing any contradictory or unrelated information from the input document? Because that's what entailment is. So we've been focusing on a lot on that. We uh, added uh, some novel information into summarization models uh, by multitask learning and reinforcement learning. So what we did was the center model is SG, which is summary generation. So the summary generation encoder takes the document and then decodes it into the summary. Now what we can do is we can share these encoders and decoders with other tasks like the task of question generation and entailment generation. So entailment generation is teaching the model. Entailment generation is a task where you are given a long premise and you have to generate a logical subset of it. 
right? So this was a classification task in the community. We converted to a generation task where given a premise and an hypothesis, you have to classify whether the premise uh, entails the hypothesis, contradicts it, or is unrelated. We converted it to a generation task. Given a long sentence, can we generate a short sentence out of it that is logically a subset of the long sentence? So this can be directly shared with the model of summarization because it's the same task, right? You want to have make sure your summary logically is entailed by the input, right? And then the question generation model is a task where given a document, can you generate important questions for that document? So you can take something like question answering data sets like Squad and convert it to a question generation data set, which teaches the summarization model about saliency. Right? It, if the model can learn to ask the right questions, then it will be able to generate those in the summary. So the same thing, you can take a long document and the input can be the document, the output can be the question. And then we showed that if you have a multi-layered encoder and a multi-layered decoder, you can share the higher level layers between these tasks, which means higher level means away from the input and away from the output, closer to the attention model. And if you share these three tasks at the higher level layers, away from the input and output, these higher level layers are more semantic in nature, right? which has been shown also in the vision community. Uh, whereas the lower level tasks closer to input and output are more syntactic and lexical. They are more looking at the words and the syntax, whereas the more layers you add, the inner layers become more about semantics. And this is the RL version of it, where you can also add these as rewards. You can generate a summary, sample the summary, and then fire entailment or saliency style classifiers on it as rewards. And finally, the third version of this was uh, the Kohling paper, uh, where we did this task called text simplification. So this is a task which is very important also for disability studies, where you want to have a complicated text, and you want it to be automatically simplified. right? Uh, so here again, we had the sentence simplification task, which can be helped with the entailment generation and paraphrase generation. So entailment generation again teaches it how to generate a logical subset, and paraphrase generation teaches it how you can paraphrase things inside the sentence to make it simple. Uh, but the interesting novel thing here was that if you worked on multitask learning, the biggest annoying factor of multitask learning, one of them, is the mixing ratio, right? You have to learn the curriculum of how to alternately train these models, how much epochs to give to each of them. So we did a multi-armed bandit model to automatically do this. So it's a dynamic model that automatically learns the best curriculum of which order to train the tasks in. And we are also extending this now to automatically choose which layers of the model to share, and also the auxiliary tasks themselves. Like if you have 100 tasks, what are the best model? What are the best auxiliary tasks that can help the given task? Yeah, so all the codes available. Uh, that's it. This is the group that does all the work. Uh, I just talk, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, we thank the sponsors. And this is so we released a new group page called nlp.cs.unc. So all the information is there: uh, the people, the papers, software, all of that. Uh, we have a postdoc opening. If anyone's interested, there's this flyer on my web page and the group page. Uh, very flexible position in terms of uh, funding, but also a lot of uh, focus on faculty development. Uh, and we'll have NLP faculty openings too, uh, including machine learning and robotics. Thanks. <laughs>